Well, thank you for coming. It's really an honor to be here. And this town is beautiful. So there are two mystic stories I have already because I was wandering around the town. One 13-year-old-ish, maybe 11-year-old-ish boy bumped by a car because his head was in Pokemon. <laughs> and then yelled at by the driver. He was uninjured, but bumped. And uh, the driver had no idea what he was doing. And the second was this pretty old woman uh, who said, this heat is so hot, I should have come out naked. Right? Right? Am I right? I said, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. You should have come out naked. So I guess I could say that up here. So that was kind of my introduction to you know, what it feels like to be in town here. So you should go walk off campus a little bit, go see what you can find. So I am, because you're all you know, here writing new stuff, I'm going to read some new stuff. The, the book is not you know, completely new, although it's, you know, it was just out. But I'm going to read um, a new essay also. So this is its first unveiling, and it's, you know, so I'll be scared properly. And um, in putting together the, the essay, or, or in reading together essays and poems, <clears throat> the strange realization happened, and it's that the poems, although they're about this big, work like essays. And the essays, though they honestly move from left margin to right margin, work more like poems. Um, and so this confuses me. It pleases me. It's, um, I don't know, it's puzzling. Um, but I, 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 I recognize that they're impersonating each other, or the forms are impersonating each other. Um, the, as I said, these poems are really short. I'm going to read um, maybe half of them twice which I've heard has been a helpful thing and a good thing because they go by really quickly and they're kind of dense. So I'll talk around them a little bit. The belief behind, these, uh, behind this form was that brief things do not need to be mm, art forms that capitulate to our supposedly short attention spans. They can be experiences of depth. And so that's what I sort of trusted in this form and trusted would happen. Um, and there's a lot, they're sort of written with a sense of a lot of space around them. Okay, so I'll, I'll read a couple of them twice so they don't get too lost. <clears throat> Belief. Light being wavy and particulate at once is instructive. Why wouldn't other things or states present as both and? For instance, I both believe and can't. Holding these together produces a wobble. I think it's time to take seriously as a stance. <clears throat> so th this is a sort of poets do physics poem in case there are too many poets to add up to like one physicist out there. Um, and apparently I got the word wobble more or less right in this, in this poem. There is a, you know, wobble in physics. And whenever a physicist comes up to you after a reading, it's always a very scary moment. <laughs> you never know which way that one's going to go. Belief. Light being wavy and particulate at once is instructive. Why wouldn't other things or states present as both and? For instance, I both believe and can't. Holding these together produces a wobble. I think it's time to take seriously as a stance. Um, this next one is called Uncertainty. 
It's not a place, but I'm grateful to be in it, where endings and known things complicate. And I, the judge I know myself to be, go to review the very heavy declarations I so often lay down like law. It's not a place at all. I just practice there, assemble some beliefs, disturb others, and put the extras into a pile for mosaics, one of my big projects for the future. The tiles in that main building there sort of made me think of a project I wish I'd be able to do. <clears throat> Talisman. The act of granting powers to a rock so it can be used to conjure luck. It worked before, it might again. How small and irregular this matter of millions of years of compression and icebergs melting, ending here, deep in a pocket, at work on the course of a diagnosis. So I was sitting out um, on these rocks earlier today, <clears throat> and some of, some of you saw me. Maybe I was unknown at that point. I wasn't sleeping. I was thinking deep thoughts. Um, but what I, I, I was thinking about this, this poem, and I was thinking about reading this poem, and I thought, um, you know, in so many ways as a human, I don't really understand time very well. And I'm trying to get better about that. Um, and the stone holding me, the rock holding me up, um, suddenly sort of felt um, like it knew really a hell of a lot more about time, you know, those millions of years collecting under my body. So um, it was a really, you know, like peaceful, powerful moment, one of those little hybrid peaceful, powerful moments. <coughs> Talisman. The act of granting powers to a rock so it can be used to conjure luck. It worked before, it might again. How small and irregular this matter of millions of years of compression and icebergs melting, ending here, deep in a pocket, at work on the course of a diagnosis. Devices. I dedicate this to that kid who got bumped by the car. <laughs> Time was different. If it was dead, we filled it with thoughts. Trees along the interstate, we occupied by seeing. And power lines rising and dipping, we wore those by trying on a phrase they necklaced by. There weren't so many ways to counter the distance everywhere. It was just fine being human and lonely. He was not fine <laughs> being by himself. He needed to find creatures and hold them in his pocket. <laughs> okay, so this one I'm... Uh, oh, okay, I'll have to read this one after. <clears throat> Probability. Most coincidences are not miraculous, but way more common than we think. It's the shiver of noticing being central in a sequence of events that makes so much seem wild and rare. Because what if it wasn't? Astonishment's 
nothing without your consent. So this poem on probability uh, brought in an email from a mathematician who was writing a, a, a book called The Math of Coincidence and Fate. And as usual, the first three lines, you know, sort of sent cold shivers. Hi, I'm a mathematician. <laughs> oh, crap. Um, but he wanted to use this poem as the, you know, sort of epigram to his book, which was an unbelievable thrill. I felt like I had jumped some math bar that I had never been able to <laughs> jump ever. And, you know, I did read up on coincidences, and yes, you know, they may be statistically one thing, in other words, you know, not miracles, but I am convinced that the way they live in us is a completely different matter. Right? And um, I think Emerson wrote in his, oh God, what is it, on astronomy or on the stars or something that, you know, only, um, only the poet knows astronomy. Right, so which, if you're a poet, you love to hear. It's like, <laughs> it's just me, I know how to do that. Um, but that sense that there are, there are many kinds of knowledge, right, that need to be patched together to make some, you know, form of holistic understanding about anything, right? So, probability. Most coincidences are not miraculous, but way more common than we think. It's the shiver of noticing being central in a sequence of events that makes so much seem wild and rare. Because what if it wasn't? Astonishment's nothing without your consent. Just a few more poems. Gratitude. It softens want into nothing mean, and lack is not so dark anymore. Things can be a little dim, less than ideal, and still amaze, as when there's been enough grief, and you aren't any longer bowing to it. One day, the pain having stopped isn't a moment. It isn't brief. It keeps going. Red bird in snow. You can choose to stop short or have it not matter, not weigh the brightness, not hold very still and be known to yourself again. A thing fills with exactly the radiance you accord it. And I'll read this last, this last poem. Time. Having only a little means you take what you've got or, because it's not worth enough, you don't. Like not picking up a penny, because it's only a little luck. So that poem requires um, a confession on my part. So I, I follow, this is a big confession, I follow free will astrology in city paper in Baltimore, which is, which is nationally syndicated, Rob Bresney. He speaks directly to me. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm really not kidding. Okay, so a couple months ago, I pick up the paper. Pisces. In her poem, Time, Piscean poet, Leah Purpura. This is in the paper, okay? wonders about not picking up a penny because it's only a little luck. 
Presumably, she's referring to a moment when you're walking down a street and you spy an almost but not quite worthless coin lying on the concrete. She theorizes that you may just leave it there. It adds next to nothing to your wealth, right? Which suggests that it also doesn't have much value as a symbol of good fortune. But we urge you to, re- me and Rob, but we urge you to reject this line of thought in the coming weeks, Pisces. In my astrological opinion, you'll be wise to capitalize on the smallest opportunities. There will be plenty of them, and they will add up. (laughs) So I'm reading my horoscope, which is my poem, and I'm supposed to (laughs) listen to myself in the next few weeks. When I wrote this poem, you know, like a year ago. So these are only... These are only some of the odd things that can happen to you as a poet in the world. I wrote to Rob, but he has not written back yet. <laughs> because really, how freaky is it that he should get a, you know, a, a note from the poet that he's quoting, or the poet herself has to read her own poem in, which is weirder. <laughs> Rob. So, so those are the poems. And now I will read the essay. And so essays are, for me, gathering spots. Um, not, they're not necessarily idea-driven, but idea-seeking. Um, others go about, very different, go about it very differently, right? You might be an idea-driven type. Um, I'd rather bump into things or have things sort of add up and reflect back to me something I had no idea was about to cohere. Um, I walk a lot, and walking helps with that kind of work. It helps the accretion happen. It helps continue the work away from the desk. It helps um, bind things together in really surprising ways. So I would... um, advise, in as much as I advise anything, um, that you consider some of your work as up and away from the desk and out and in motion. Um, You know, you can take a little pad with you. My dog is so accustomed to me taking out the little pad that when I do it, she just sits. It's this, you know, this great reaction. Um, So this is called Walk with Snowy Things. And it was not only helped along by a walk, but it tracks the accretion of things on an actual walk, which is, you know, unusual, I understand. Walk with snowy things. That wasn't snow, but it should have been. Looks to be. Lacy with dirt, side of the road, gouged and firmed by the melt-freeze cycle. What was it I passed? Sixty-something degrees in late December, not proper snow, but a snarl of gray cotton, scoured and cinched in the snowy habit of catching flung grit. And what's this? A block later, a snow-colored eggshell, also wrong in December, resting as fallen shells rest in the grass gently and up, What happens with eggs is not at all gentle, that breaking apart of a known world for another. The not eggshell is a packing chip. In pasta terms, an orecchietti, a little ear. Or when I was a kid, the half shell I loved, all that delicious foam for licking, Venus's floating hair for braiding, and I'd help her down into scallopy waves and swim with her body to body, fully the animal I knew myself to be. There's more not snow on the east side of the neighborhood. This handful, why so much cotton today? Spotted with blood, like a sick x-rayed lung, part of a rough tableau on the grass, sifted round with packets of sugar, a burned plastic bottle, and inside the bottle, a needle. Addicts, too, have their weird, tidy gestures, like anyone fitting the cap on a jar before tossing it out. Hard to imagine this wasn't arranged, just come upon already a story. Light gently touching the shoelace tourniquet, sugar for cutting, matches for cooking. 
Someone's next moment gauzed up in this spot, a sweet, blameless hour, soft, with no edges hastening back, the fog world easeful and grainy and fat. And here's the full mess of that piece. Around the corner, a single knot snowflake in a sidewalk crack where it won't unmelt, whatever it is, confetti far from its parade or a fallen snow planet. It's not meaning I'm looking for in the way these things come, if indeed they come from anywhere, or we're set on arriving and being seen, or speaking to me in a language we share. All I know is I'm the site of, I'm where they meet, under pretense of snow, suggestion of snow, under snow's wing, or a snow scene setting up, calling the snow-like in, down, and here. Practice snow, snow attempts and alerts, where the white bits found and arranged their thinking, got bent on patterning up into order, I get to be a gathering spot, like a ring of rocks in clear, shallow water where trout float over their pearly young. Such are the happier snow-like things, snow-like betters, stuff not made of waste or grief. This dandelion held in its final white phase, unblown, geodesic, still wrong in December, but so unto itself, there's no need to translate it out of garbage and junk. Either way though, so much is given. All these versions of looking into what's always been there, and suddenly the filling commences. There are relations, one comes as another, things are rekind. A vision is nothing a person chooses. A vision comes flying, comes landing, unwalled, light laved, if you make of yourself a hospitable place that won't melt a thing, step on, step over, or proceed with the business of a day, which so often means nothing to see on this walk, just keep going, enough with the stopping and sniffing, move on. But if things pile up, as they do, if allowed, then here we go. Tufts of white dog hair, combed out or shed, husky fur, collie fur, dry and nest ready. Once I found a nest made entirely of human hair, so perfectly bark colored, soft and expandable, that air and light weave, imagine how easy to work with, a dream, though as a nest, a total mistake. Too sheer, no sticks or mud mingled in. There it was, the extravagant thought, or evidence of a mind being new to a task. The technique coming clear after going so wrong, the bird light blinking on, the way obvious now. A bird reviewing its failed fallen nest, head bent to the side, you've done this too, revising a thought. Something like, oh, right, I get it, twigs. <laughs> then work some hair in, but only a little. Here's a piece of popcorn ducking behind a blade of grass. It looks, it looks at first like chewed gum or a molar, and then more like cotton, raw from the field. First time I saw the real thing, Tuscaloosa, I asked my friend to stop the truck right there, side of the road, so I could get out and walk into the field and touch it. I was in my mid-40s, a mid-40-year-old person who'd never seen cotton. Not those gray photos in the Britannica list of major state crops, not packed tight in a blue first aid box, but a form that moved into the neck and back, bent to the task, ache in the gut, and then it became a whole different drive. My fresh cotton rough in its bowl in my hand, the weight of it gone entirely strange, very dense, sort of cold, like holding a bullet for the first time. This is bird shit, rain thinned on the sidewalk, 
a splotchy snow shadow gathering as all this stuff is for the eye training toward it. Offerings that come once the frame is constructed, likenesses finding a home, vision forming. Out in a field where I'm to meet it, out in a field where I'm also the field. I don't know what the moment's thinking, but it's telling itself. Things are alive without me and within. There is nothing shut up or remote, goes the poem, but everywhere being clothed with what itself adorns. How I understand the truth of that, yes, but also how I read the word first as adores, being clothed with what itself adores. Turning the corner, this little stone rabbit corralled with stone frogs in a garden scene is hunched in a position called sniff the ground and show off my white tail forever. The white tail's more cotton and up comes the moment when as a kid, the words first pulled apart, cotton and tail. And it wasn't one single blur of a word, cottontail, just some sounds that meant rabbit. How often I missed things so clear to everyone else. Adult versions persist, still having a hard time saying waistcoat, not waistcoat, and dropping that C in victuals so as to be one with those who know vittles, say vittles, and mean it. Or, as we said growing up, roast pan, since it belonged to the roast alone, was not itself roasting, as the more proper roasting pan suggests. I got corrected on that some years ago, but I'm sticking with the original, my language, my people's roast pan. And here's my big white dog named Ruby, go figure, leaning in head to head, discussing something with one of the decorative stone frogs in our neighbor's pastoral compound. Inside her is a dog thought, generations post wild. But still, here she is, heating a big-eyed white lump of frog that's got something delicious to say to her. So goes my white spotted world, neighborhood at least, and all the walk-found things that came to me came to be held. Hear that? Be held. The intensified form. The stand back so as to see the light version or angle that promises by holding a thing, you'll be held by it. That attention swings both ways at once. And what to do with that thought. I think go on briefly is a reasonable plan. I'm nearly home now. Here's a black locust pod whose inner white bed isn't full white, but cut with cream, fuzzed like young antlers in low sun. And the whole thing softened me so unexpectedly that I couldn't tell which came first, the velvety sheen or that it approached without words and went something like, hey, that's how I feel about a beloved friend I hardly ever get to see. And in this next pod, one loaded with seeds, here's how I feel with her around, multiplied and fed, loaved and fished. Then up comes a compact pod for two, which might also be a dinner table. A diner table is more precise since we like to eat bacon and eggs together. Or it's a skiff, skiff, is old timey, or bark, or dory, or best of all, coracle, since these fit her sensibility. And she'd get a kick out of it if I said, pointing down with my toe, look, there's our boat, get in, let's go. Because you can do that with some people, row so easily far from shore. So here, this pod is how distance breaks up. How loss softens, leads back, little gift embedded in litter, in leaves, is how a letter the day wrote me arrived. All these letters arriving, I keep being read to. 
So much comes in and arranges today, whitely, comes shining, comes thinned in pangs and shocks, rounded, fat, wet, or sharp and piercing. So much figures forth. I must be wanting. I believe it takes a very great yearning to call down so great a giving. Thank you. Thank you. Am I to stand up here and be questioned? If you don't. Yes, I think. I think that's really well said. Um, where you stand in life at a certain point in your development or you know, trajectory and the different qualities, I'm just gonna like, respond back, the different qualities of reflection that take place. And you know, maybe part of what you're suggesting or some of what I'm hearing is as you get older, there is a drive to make a story, right? Something sort of cohesive, you know, about your past. Um, and yet, at the same time, whatever is ahead of you r remains deeply uncertain. Still, we hope. I, I, I hope it is in some ways, you know, because um, you know that sense of. Uh, the this sort of carpet just rolling out ahead of you in a totally prescribed way is deadly. Um, so, you know, to, to write is that weird balance between having to make certain decisions that are certain on the page and also remaining, which is what you're saying, right? Remaining open to surprise or curiosity or mystery. Mm -hmm. You said it really well. Oh, go ahead. Hmm. Okay, well, there's a huge variation. Some poems in here l literally all, like came down, you know, received, like, you know, light through the <laughs> like stained glass, <laughs> right down there from that hand, right here. And, <laughs> and, and others, you know, still this big, you know, took years. And I don't mean years of everyday work. Sometimes, you know, you reach a peak of frustration and put the thing aside and think, oh, for God's sake, you know, you're hopeless. <laughs> but there's a, little, there's a little bit of light still shining, right? So you don't like put it in a big metal filing cabinet. You just let it sit there for a while. And then, you know, look at it every now and then. And so, so that process can actually, you know, can take years. Um, even up until the point of publishing the thing. So I had a final line on one of these poems that I thought was really good um, and I thought it was like kind of just tough and this editor you know took the poem and he said I really like this but without the last line and I I literally you know I was like I, I read the email and I was like Steve and then I read it again with these you know kind of new eyes and I thought whoa that's kind of good without that last line which I was so deeply attached to um, so you know Sometimes you have to remain radically open, you know, to the end. 
Um, and I guess I can't, I guess the word product also I can't, um, I can't use. So final little entity, soul, being, creature, because they still feel alive. That's why I would change the word. Oh, I'm, I'm a terrible picker, really awful. <laughs> I'm, I'm the worst. Yes, you were there, sorry. Told you. I, I, I am. I mean, it's it's a it's it, it's like an actual creature that I face off with, you know. Yeah, it's like a big, warm body, that um, works into the work in ways that I don't really think about consciously, and then am told, "Wow, you you work a lot with time, as you know, conceptually or time frames," and um, that's always interesting to me. It's it's not really you know a planned. Um, project, but when I look back on it, and apparently when other people read it, pick it up and put it in their newspaper, it appears that way to them too. But that's a kind of interesting way to work, you know, to not necessarily have such a clamped version vision of you know what your project is, um, and to hear from other people what they think is going on, and you know to be open to being surprised at what, what others are. Are, are saying about your work. It's really illuminating. Um, you know, you think you're doing this one thing and then others are hearing some other reverb that's really important, which is a good thing you're here. Because I'll tell you that kind of thing. Yeah, for, formally that I was conscious of wanting to work really short and feeling that um, short things could rightfully be um, an experience of depth and not an experience of simple brevity, get in, get out, don't linger, as Raymond Carver said. Um, so I was really conscious of receiving um, you know, images and impressions from the world and, and, and moving them into, our, you know, knowing that the, this thing would be just that thought or just that image worked over, but just that. Not spun out, not explored in you know pages and pages. I really wanted a lot of space around this kind of you know moment to be part of that moment. I wanted the space and the thought space to be part of the poem. So I was very conscious of keeping it really short. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how the, I can't remember how you did it, but you talked about how the internet essays were coming out of the poems, yeah. and the poems were coming out of the poems. These are supposedly called lyric essays, whatever little subgenre that is. Um, apparently, I do that. And I say apparently <laughs> because the, the sort of subgenrefication for a writer can be kind of limiting. It, it, I don't know. It feels like you're being marketed in some little, I'm very
Yes, sir. I think both, really. I think, yes, do what you want to do and let somebody else, you know, call you something. On the other hand, if you discover there's a subgenre out there and it aligns with what you're doing, and therefore there's lots of interesting, rich work there, that's revelational too. You know, so you can say, whoa, I've been doing this. I didn't know there was a name for it. I thought I was the only one, right? You know how all of those, all those revelations go. All right, so in that sense, it's really helpful, I think. Yeah. Good. Okay, thank you so much.